how many people like me absolutely love the holidays? I love the holidays. Oh, my goodness. I, and Thanksgiving may be my favorite of them. But as I thought about it, I think it's kind of the favorite because it's a gateway just on into Christmas. It's like a tune-up for the heart, right? I hope you had some time to give thanks during the month of November and certainly on Thanksgiving for just life and uh, health and family and different things. You may be here and go, well, my health is not good. My family's all jacked up. Well, we'll give thanks that Jesus is the Lord of all of it, all right? But... Uh, he can, he can fix some things, and um, he just needs our, our faith in stepping forward in all of it. But I, I, I love Thanksgiving, and it, I do believe it is a kind of a gateway into Christmas, and I love Christmas. I always have. I love everything about it, especially how it brings the family together. And I should say that just of all the holidays, I, I, I'm one of those that our, our family is in pretty decent shape, and uh, I, I've got eight grandchildren. I know some of you are new to us. You're shocked right now that I'm that old, but it's, it's true. April and I married at nine and eight years old. We did that, and that's how that worked out. But uh, having all eight of them in one house, all of them under 10 years old, man, it's on when you, when you have that. So we're tired, <laughs> but... But it was a, just a great time uh, for all of us. So I do love how it brings us together. I love how there truly is in, in, in the Christmas time, uh, oftentimes a spirit of Christmas cheer and optimism that can be felt uh, during the Christmas season. And we can honestly see and feel the Christmas spirit at certain times around us. And I believe that in part is the thrill of hope. Amen. It is the thrill of hope. The hope for the better tomorrow. Why is that? Because Jesus has come. Yeah, We're celebrating because Jesus has come. As a pastor, I'm also acutely aware of the emotional pain and trauma that the Christmas season brings to so many people who are in certain seasons of their life. Christmas can often remind us uh, of hard years growing up, uh, perhaps even trauma or abuse, or at the very least, dashed expectations of a harsh disappointment of what family at Christmas time should be in light of our family's present dysfunction. Sometimes you have that. Other times we find ourselves in a season where the loss of a loved one is still fresh and Christmas reminds us that there's an empty seat at the table uh, or an empty space around the tree, empty feelings, and just that we just have a broken heart. And so when we have the tragedies that have hit us uh, in a Christmas season, whether that's Christmas present or Christmas past, we oftentimes associate all things Christmas with those raw feelings. To see a Christmas tree, to hear Christmas carols uh, doesn't bring the joy uh, that it once did. It just brings a lot of, of pain to so many people. And so there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of tears shed at Christmas time. And I do want you just to hold those thoughts uh, for that. One of the greatest challenges for me in the Christmas season every year is how to speak into all those things in the Christmas series or in the Christmas season. And the truly, I just have to believe that the Holy Spirit of God is going to give every individual what they need out of whatever that we bring here. Uh, because I know this, after 37 years of preaching Christmas series, <laughs> uh, the story is the story. And it has not changed. We can't make up some new stuff. I know some pastors who do make up some stuff as they go. But uh, the story is the story, and we're a Bible-preaching church here. There's, there's Mary and Joseph, the stable, the manger, the angels, the shepherds, the star, and the magi. And the story is the story, but it remains the greatest story ever told. God has become flesh, and not just any flesh, but he's become a baby, and a baby is born into the world to dwell among us as God Almighty. I don't know a greater story to tell in any season than that story. So I've chosen in the spirit, uh, the spirit of our major series this, this year, uh, which was more to the story series, as you know. Um, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of Christmas, a more to the story, if you will, centering our attention on Bethlehem specifically and the hope that we find here or should we say we hope we find there. Uh, however, for many years in Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem was associated with death and grief 
And even after the birth of our Lord, it was associated with death and grief for uh, uh, quite a season there. Bethlehem is mentioned 53 times in the scriptures, and it is a very important place. And we all know it mainly for one thing, the one happening that everybody in the world seems to know happened in Bethlehem, and that was that a Savior was born into the world there. However, God was setting the stage of Bethlehem for 1,700 years before Jesus was born in that place. Bethlehem was relatively a small place, but it was, some, it was home to some very big events that we see in Scripture. And so for each week, uh, right up to Christmas Eve, we'll be walking through some of those events that happened there, and we're going to see something very interesting. We're going to see a backstory of God just setting the stage and God telling his story over and over and over again in just what happened in Bethlehem. What I'm going to call that a little bit is um, I just want to show you some little vignettes, if you will, or just like a uh, those of you who have kids in school or remember having kids in school, remember the flashcards? You pop up a card and the kid sees it and, and the memory kicks in and you go, oh, yeah. I know those your multiplication tables or it's a place or a word association. And so these little flash pictures of, of what? Flash pictures of Jesus in each portion of this scripture. And you will see that it's all of his all of history, of course, is his story. And we'll see him telling it over and over again. We'll see it over and over in this series, Jesus walking through time and space, directing the affairs of of all mankind and showing us his plans and his hope for us in all of it. And I love that I have a God that can do such a thing because it helps me to know that my tomorrow is taken care of. Amen? He sees the beginning and the end and he's worked it out and God is walking us through his plans for us. So truly I trust as we walk through this series together you will find your hope in Bethlehem as well. And just maybe you'll experience what we're calling the thrill of hope in it. And Lord, I hope so, if I can help you find it. All right? So, uh, but you've got to come ready, okay? Come ready. When you, when you get here, be ready to worship with us uh, for that. In uh, 1847, a French poet wrote a beautiful poem, Cantique de Noël, which just means Christmas hymn. Uh, Ten years later, it was translated and set to music for us here in America, and you know it as our beloved carol, uh, O Holy Night. Uh, hands down my favorite. Hands down my favorite. Um, notice the wording of that beautiful Christmas carol. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. I've underlined the important words here for you. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared. And the spirit felt its worth. Whereas we had the, the old language, the soul, our soul felt its worth. We didn't know what we were worth until Jesus appeared. We were worth so much, God sent His only Son into this world to save us from what? Our sin and our error that we were pining in, languishing in. I didn't know what I was worth until I realized this story. Amen. And then my soul felt its worth. And there are words for our series, a thrill of hope and a weary world rejoices. We serve one another, we serve the Lord, but we are doing it in a weary world. A weary, weary world. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. It ought to, listen, if you feel the thrill of hope, it ought to bring worship into your heart and into your life. You saw the title as we got into this for this uh, particular message uh, Rachel's Tears. Rachel's Tears. Certainly we're weary of so much in our world right now. Weariness that brings tears. We're weary from elections, political and social upheaval, 
weary of division and wars and rumors of wars and COVID vaccines. Lord have mercy, every other commercial as you got your vaccine, right? Weary of the sin, uh, our own sin and sins of our society. We're truly a world in sin and error pining still. Someone said the hallmark of Christmas is joy. I'm about to believe the hallmark of Christmas is the Hallmark movies, right? <laughs> hallmark means what it's noted for, what it's noted for. Well, someone said it again, the hallmark of Christmas is joy, and maybe it is. But I know this, I know for certain that it is hope. It is hope. And when we find the hope of what Christmas means, it should produce joy in our hearts. Thus, the thrill of hope. Interestingly enough, the first mention of Bethlehem in the Bible is one of incredible sorrow and pain. And it's our setting that we have for today. And that's in Genesis chapter 35 where it tells us about Jacob and his family that are traveling to Bethlehem. And his wife, Rachel, tragically goes into labor with her second child and she dies in childbirth and she was buried in Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And you see the verses that are there. Let's just read it together. Then they journeyed from uh, Bethel. You guys remember who I'm talking about here, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what was Jacob's, uh, what was he renamed? Israel. Israel. So it's out of, out of this man, uh, you know, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. We have the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the, this is the setting of this backstory here that we have. As they're traveling, remember he has two wives. He has Rachel and Leah, and hopefully many of you will remember the backstory of that. But here at this time period, Rachel goes into labor, and she had hard labor, verse 17. And when, there, when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son, which was just her second child. It was Joseph was the first son, right? And her soul was as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoniah, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. The Tower of Eder is also uh, known as Migdal Edar. It is this specific location, I believe, that Jesus was born. This exact location. The prophet Micah refers to it prophetically. The tower is a, this tower that's being spoken of here is a watchtower, and not just any watchtower, but let me move you forward in to, to Jesus' day, because this is 1,700 years here that's between these events. In Jesus' day, it was used to observe uh, the shepherd's fields. Someone would be uh, looking out over the field there, and they're, they're watching over uh, the lambs that... By the way, these were the lambs that were born specifically for temple sacrifices. That's what these fields in Bethlehem were used for at this location. In Jacob's day, 1,700 years before, uh, there was, 1,700 years before there was even a... Well, that's, let me get the right date. 17 years before Jesus was born, but also hundreds of years before there was a temple built in Jerusalem. It was a watchtower for this area of Bethlehem for approaching enemies and in invading armies. So there's a tower that is there. I want you to get that in your mind. The prophet Micah describes it, and he tells the, the Lord how he's, he's saying this is how the Lord is going to rescue Zion or Jerusalem in this day or the, the people of Zion, the Jewish people in that day declares the Lord I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted so in other words there's a judgment that, is, that is, has come you know that would come uh, at a certain point and we knew that would be the Babylonian army that came and invaded and the lame, verse 7, I will make the remnant and those who are cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and evermore, and you, O tower of the flock, that, that tower of the flock is, is that uh, Migdal Edar, or Eder, 
that is the same place, it's this one location, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. So Genesis records that Jacob, uh, he, sp he spread his tent before Migdal Edar, the place where King Messiah will reveal himself at the end of days. Now, Jacob didn't have that, you know, the Bible is being recorded uh, by someone after Jacob, so he didn't know about all these other events. He's just caught up in the one event here. He's come to this place, and his wife, Rachel, uh, is in great distress and dying, giving birth to a child. So what are we to make of this information that we have seen here so far. Well, first we know that Migdal Edar was the watchtower that guarded the temple flocks, this is in Jesus' day, that were being raised to serve as sacrificial animals uh, and in the temple. These were not just any flock uh, of sheep or, or herd of sheep. The shepherds in Jesus' day who kept them were uh, men who were specifically trained for this royal task they were educated in what, at what the, the sacrificial animal had to be. Uh, no blemishes, no faults, as most of you are, are aware of those things. And it was their job to make sure that none of these sacrificial lambs were hurt or maimed in any way. Uh, because sadly, they were, they were sold for a lot of money up in Jerusalem for those uh, people who would come uh, at Passover and have their sacrificial lamb. They had to have one without spot, without blemish, and so forth. So these lambs were apparently, and hear the wording, they, when they were born in Jesus' day, they were wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's what they called them. They wrapped every lamb uh, that way to protect them from injury, and they were also used to wrap, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ when he was born, as we read in, in the story there. Now, all the way back in Genesis 35, uh, I want you to understand that Genesis 35 is known as the death chapter uh, of Genesis because in Genesis 35, uh, it records the death of Deborah who was the nurse to Rebekah and Rebekah was Isaac's wife. So she uh, has become an ancient older woman has passed away. And we just read about the death of Rachel and it goes on to record the death of the patriarch Isaac. All of these things happen in Genesis 35. When you enter into Bethlehem, even in this day, well, the city has grown a little further now, but in Bethlehem, what used to be the entrance point was Ra is, is Rachel's tomb. It is one of the markers of the city. Death, grief, and suffering, and a mother dying in childbirth seems an ominous introduction to a place that we only associate with the joy of Christmas. Would you agree? I mean, that just seems so, so strange and so odd. But in the midst of all this, we get a glimpse of a much bigger picture that God would have us to see. And certainly it is one of the shortfalls of human nature, especially in our day, that we do not have enough attention span to consider something larger than ourselves or something bigger than, you know, just what our own family are going through. And you think about how much of your life is consumed with just what's happening to you your bills, your needs, and I, I realize that that is a big thing, but I'll promise you some of the things in your life would become much smaller if you could ever get an attention span bigger than your own self and you could see the needs of others and the needs of the world and what's happening in the world. Amen. So, the condition of the world is one thing we should take notice of. Uh, we should take notice to consider all that's happening around us to think on all that's happening in the world. We ought to take time to consider just exactly what time it is, and I don't mean almost time to get out of church, <laughs> how late the hour is. I mean the hour. Not this hour, but the hour. How much nearer we are to the Lord's return. And we should find all of our answers for these things in Scripture. Truly, this is the very day Truly, this very day, there are many things that are making news in the scriptures that foretell what will happen in the world around us that we're living in right now. But we're so consumed with ourselves. As, as God's people, we're so consumed with ourselves, we don't take time to see it. 
again, the condition of the world, our culture, the politics, the social setting that is ever-changing, ever-evolving. In the bigger scene, the nations that are rebelling against God and His Word, the armies that are amassing. It's little blurbs on the news, but you realize the armies are amassing? In the world, there's an arms build up again. There's enough ammunition, and I should say the nuclear powers to destroy the world a hundred times over, and they're still amassing more. Uh, we are being, we're seeing a time period where the armies and nations are being led by an incredible antichrist spirit, an incredible antichrist spirit that just does not matter to them whether you exterminate a million people or. Uh, march through and bomb out cities and kill children uh, what else could be more evil than that and yet it barely makes the news here mm -hmm. wicked governments are being manipulated by an antichrist spirit that is a loose in the world ahead of the real antichrist appearing and the church in so many places is lukewarm asleep or dead there's a great falling away by so many Christians, truly just as Paul told Timothy in his very last letter that it would be in these days, in these last days, in these final hours, if you will, on the earth. Here is the condition. And by the way, when he talks about this, he's specifically meaning this. This is the condition of the church, not just the world. The church in the latter days in some places will be just like the world. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant. Let me hold right there. That's self-absorbed. I can't see anything but my own needs and what I, what I have. They'll be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Can't make them happy. Can't make them happy. Here's everything you've ever wanted, and you're still unhappy. You have a hundred times more than your grandparents had. Un unhappy, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. That describes the church in America more than anything. Yes. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households, capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Uh, we have more information than we've ever had, i.e. the Internet. Yes. We're ever learning and can't find the truth. Amen. Jude chapter 1, verse 17, also speaking of these last days, then said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. And yet there's a great revival that is happening in other parts of the world. As we've heard from our missionaries this past month uh, that were here. We have thousands of people, tens of thousands of people coming to Christ while the, much of the Western world looks on with a yawn. Yeah. We hear about, here's, t here's a team going to Pakistan and going to minister to 10,000 students. Not in my lifetime have I heard anything like that. Yeah. And our, you know what we do? We, oh, yeah, what are we going to have for lunch? <laughs> right? We have no idea what time it is in this world. So, the prophet Joel speaks of a time before the tribulation period on the earth in chapter 2. And it, came to, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will, uh, shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. The prophet goes on to say, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we're seeing multitudes in many parts of the world calling on the name of the Lord and coming to faith and a great falling away in other places. Churches that were once great churches doing great things are, are, are for sale and, and shutting down and becoming other things. And it's just the strangeness that's going on in the world, but God said it would be this way. 
and we tend to only see the, the little things that are just in front of us that just affect our life just for the moment. And the world is shaping up, ladies and gentlemen, for the next advent. You realize the first advent is when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But the next advent will be when Jesus returns for his church. The world is setting up for that, and I believe it will be in my lifetime. I'm convinced it will be in my lifetime. And, and in this world right now, again, in its antichrist spirit, is setting hatred towards the gospel and toward Christians and the true church of Jesus Christ. The only threat to Satan who is behind all of this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the threat that he feels, and that's the threat that he responds to. And so it was in the events of his first coming. It is just like it is today as we're preparing for his next coming. Upon hearing the news that Jesus was born into the world, King Herod, man, he got busy and ordered the slaughter of all the babies in Bethlehem in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw... And he had been tricked by the wise men. He became, uh, he became uh, furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old and under according to the time that had been uh, ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Let me add in here. You got Rachel 1,700 years before Jesus was born. You move up now 600 years before Jesus was born. Jeremiah prophetically speaks of both of these events. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. See, Rachel is associated with Bethlehem and will be forever. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And Jeremiah, 600 years before the happening in Bethlehem, knew there would be another cry coming out of Bethlehem and for this great slaughter that was going to happen to these children. Jeremiah said this almost, again, 600 years before Jesus was born. Jeremiah, in his own life, in this moment, was in Jerusalem, and the, the city was laid waste and was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. The prophet Jeremiah was taken captive uh, and he was led from Jerusalem to Ramah. Watch now. And there he was released in Ramah and prophetically spoke those words that I just read. Ramah is uh, north of Jerusalem and Bethlehem is just a little bit south of Jerusalem and they're about 11 miles apart. In our Genesis story... Jacob, along with Rachel and all their family, were traveling from the area of Ramah, and they were going to Bethlehem. Ramah was a city that was also the center of many things in Scripture. Much of the Old Testament has references of Ramah, but for our purpose today, let me just simply say that it became known as a city that belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. If you're still with me, would you say amen? amen. amen. All right, thank God I didn't lose you and all that. Ramah is associated with Benjamin and Bethlehem is also associated with Benjamin. So here's the question. Who is Benjamin? Who is Benjamin? Benjamin was the baby that Rachel gave birth to as she lay dying from child labor. She was about to name him what? I just read it a moment ago. You remember? Benoni. Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. Son of my sorrow. But her husband, Jacob, stepped up before they hung that horrible name on him and gave him the name Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. He's not going to be known as the son of sorrow. He'll be known as the son of my right hand. But because it was uttered here that the Scripture captured both those things for us, Benjamin would be the youngest, hear what I'm telling you, the youngest of the twelve sons who became the 12 tribes of all of Israel. This was the last one, the boy that completed it all. Now, let's look at some of those vignettes that I just mentioned, and hopefully I can let you see the thrill of hope in all of this. Let's see how God, 1,700 years before Jesus was born in this town that was filled with so much grief and pain and suffering, was showing a little glimpse of who he would be. Actually, this is the first picture I would want you to see. Benoni is a picture of Jesus. 
a little vignette, a little flash card of Jesus, if you will. Um, he would be born, Jesus would be born into this world and known as a man of sorrows. He's described as a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, 3 says of our lovely Lord Jesus that he would be despised and rejected of men, a man of what? Sorrows, sorrows and acquainted with what? Did not Mary and Joseph go to the temple when Jesus was born for his own dedication time? And there they were confronted by Simeon, uh, the prophet, uh, who came to them, Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and 35, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the what? The fall and rising of many in Israel. Do you see that? It's a death, burial, and resurrection. And for a sign that is opposed... And a sword will pierce through his own soul also, so the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. Rachel's soul was also pierced, no doubt, when she was giving birth to what would be Benjamin. On her deathbed, her soul was pierced, bringing the end the son of sorrows. And Mary's soul was also pierced as she watched Jesus, her son, die on the cross. But in doing so, he was doing something else for all of us, and here is where Rachel becomes a picture or a little vignette, a little flashcard uh, of Jesus as well. Rachel, you may recall, if, if you remember all the way back in our More to the Story series, when we talked about uh, Jacob and him marrying uh, Rachel and Leah and how all that worked out, uh, you might remember that Rachel was a shepherdess. Beautiful, shapely, lovely young woman that he immediately fell in love with. And we know that, of course, Jesus is the great shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus would die like Rachel. Jesus would die like Rachel. And listen, if you're following me close, you may be saying, no, no, wait a minute, Roy, didn't Jesus die on a cross and didn't Rachel die in childbirth? Yes, but Jesus also died in childbirth. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin, and she called him on her deathbed, son of sorrows. Jesus, is the, it, Jesus in the sorrow of death was giving birth to the church on the cross, and they wrapped Jesus up uh, after his death in the same way they wrapped him at his birth in linen swaddling clothes. In the same way, swaddling clothes were used in many ways. They would wrap up those young lambs, as I mentioned a while ago, when they were born, because why? They were destined to be these sacrificial lambs in the temple. And they would also use swaddling clothes to wrap up dead bodies and put the spices on them and so forth. It's linen clothes. They were linen grave clothes, if you will. The lambs were born to die. And so was Jesus, the Lamb of God. He was destined to die for the sins of the world. Did you miss that part where Jesus died to give birth to me and you? He died to give birth to, well, to the body, the church. Benjamin is also a, a picture of Jesus. Both those names become the picture of who he was. What does Benjamin mean again? Anybody remember? Son of my right hand. And where did Jesus go after his death and burial and resurrection 40 days after, later upon his ascension back to heaven? He went to the Father's to be our what? Our heavenly Benjamin, if you will. Luke 22 and verse 69, But from now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the of the power of God. Listen to Peter's message on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. When Stephen, the first deacon, was being stoned to death, he looked toward heaven in Acts 7 and verse 56 and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the the right hand of God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He's speaking of Jesus. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for our sins, he sat down at the 
of the majesty on high. It is a New Testament theme that is emphasized and magnified all through the New Testament that Jesus is seated in the position of power at the Father's right hand. He is our intercessor. He is our high priest. It is the position of power and authority. Almost every epistle makes mention of this incredible thing that we see a glimpse of 1,700 years before he was born. Now let's back up just a bit. Rachel was Jacob's first choice for a wife, but his father-in-law, you may remember, old Laban, old trickster Laban. Remember Jacob was a trickster, and he met his match. God will always make sure you meet your match, right? <laughs> he wanted to marry Rachel. He was so heartsick for her, but Leah over here was not as pretty as Rachel, and Laban, you know how they did the weddings. You remember how they did that? They just, uh, you just went in your tent, and it was dark at night, and well, he just sent the other woman in. So what he bought in the daytime and he got in the night did not look right the next morning, <laughs> all right? So he was married to Leah, and he worked another seven years before he could have Rachel, his first choice for a wife. Is that just random? Is, there's nothing random in the scriptures, right? All right. Rachel, I mentioned, was a picture, of Jesus, a picture of Jesus, but he's also a picture of the Jews. She is a picture of the Jews. Israel. She's a picture of that. Rachel's name means little lamb. Leah is a picture of the church. If you're a Leah here, I apologize, but your name means cow. <laughs> right? Some of you remember that. I'm sorry. Just telling you like it is. Jesus' first ministry and desire was for the Jews to receive him as their Messiah. Sometimes I think I'll rip through stuff and you guys are not tracking with me. Jacob loved Rachel, his first choice. Jesus loved Israel, his first choice. Do you see it? Matthew 15, 24, he answered, Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep, the lamb of the house of Israel. John 1, 1 reminds us that he came into his own, and his own received him not. Right? On Pilate's judgment porch, all that comes to fruition when the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus. We will not have this man rule and reign over us. We will not have him. Give us Caesar. Well, Caesar's our friend, right? We'll not have this man rule and reign over us away with him, which is what mankind still does to this hour, oftentimes when presented with the gospel that requires a death in your own life and a surrender of your life and asking Christ to then fill you with his life. You're making an exchange life right here, and it's one most of mankind is not willing to do. I, I want to do my own thing. I will not have this man rule and reign over me away with him. I don't want anything to do with the church and the gospel. Some of you had that Thanksgiving meal. And some of you will have that kind of Christmas. I don't want that person around me. I don't want that at all. And they proclaim that and they choose to rule themselves and live as their own gods. Jesus was rejected, as you know, by most of the Jewish people. And he's largely rejected by them still to this hour. Yet he is the great shepherd, but Israel would not come to him. Leah is a picture of the church and all this. You still with me? Leah was the first to give Jacob sons. It is only by coming to the Son of God that one can become the sons of God. And this is done through what we call the rebirth, right? Jesus said, you must be born again it was the church that was empowered on the day of Pentecost that gave Jesus his first sons through their repentance of their sins and coming to him by faith like Leah gave Jacob's sons first a bit later it is preached Acts chapter 4 verse 12 and there, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men uh, by which we must be saved 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 26, For in Christ Jesus you are all the, what is it? Sons of God through faith. Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent His Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It, listen, if you know the Lord, you know there's just tender times when He comes to you through the Word of God or through sometimes just the goodness of God, and your heart just cries out, Dad, thank you, God. You just, you just sense that. Our hearts cry that out. His Spirit is in us. We receive that when we confess our sins and we put our faith in Him for our salvation. And this is where all our hope for heaven is bound up, is in that. That's where the thrill of hope is birthed out of. Rachel, you may recall, said to Jacob when she was childless and Leah was over here just spitting out them babies, Rachel comes to Jacob and says, Give me sons or I will die. You remember it? You give me sons or I'm going to die. And she finally gives birth to Joseph. And then in her giving birth to Benjamin, her second son, and she does die. Jesus has died for every one of us so we could be born again. You have to see that picture. So what about the Jews then? What about them? Again, Rachel is a picture of the Jewish people here as well. History tells of the Jewish weeping and long-suffering, if you will, the dysphoria that's thousands of years old now. Uh, all that can be back to Deuteronomy when God said, listen, when you finally reject me, I'm going to send you into all the nations of the earth. And you're going to be persecuted. And they have been. Name a people... Name a people who have been so persecuted for so long by so many as the Jewish people. But they are still God's chosen people. And that has never changed. Rachel is the bride of Jacob. Jacob's other name is what? Israel. Israel. Jacob was not allowed to go into Rachel for how many years? Seven, seven years. After seven years, Jacob could have Rachel. After, tell me again how many years? Seven. One more time. Seven. It is a picture of the seven year tribulation time on the earth that we read about in the book of Daniel and is confirmed in the book of Revelation. Revelation means to reveal, to roll back the tent curtain. Open the tent curtain, let her in. Reveal who you are. To roll back a curtain is to reveal what's behind the curtain. Y'all remember, let's make a deal, don't you? You got $150 in your hand, but you can have what's behind the curtain. Young people, you go look it up. <laughs> After seven years of tribulation, the curtain will finally be rolled back, and the blinders will be rolled off the eyes of the Jews, and Jesus will be perfectly accepted as their Messiah and crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will be recognized as their Messiah. He will usher in a new millennial reign uh, with him, with them, and with us, all of us who are sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you can see, watch now, in this one simple story, do you see the whole history of everything that is, was, and coming is told in that one story. Just Rachel comes into Bethlehem, dies in childbirth, the names that are given, all the circumstances, and, and Jesus is saying, I'm telling you everything I want you to know and everything I'm going to do and everything I'm going to be and everything that's going to come in that story. And I want you to see it. Who but God, right? So what about us today? What is your hope in? Lord, I hope it's not in politics. Yeah. It's necessary. Listen, I hope it's not in it. I hope it's not in the stock markets or in any random person, a job, a financial situation, holding on to whatever you think you have. I don't know about all of you but I can tell you at the age I am right now, I've been with a lot of people in my 57 years, and my 37 years as pastor, 
who thought they had a retirement and woke up to find out it was gone in one day. Oh, it's secure. It's with such and such place. <laughs> really? You think that still? Your hope and your security and everything that you need to be about needs to be wrapped up in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and what you find in the Scriptures. Is your heart heavy today from weeping and suffering caused in this world? Rachel's weeping gave birth to a son of the right hand. This world is full of suffering and heartache. However, the birth of Jesus was a death knell for all suffering and sorrow. And I love that. I truly love that. It was a death knell to all of it. You see, he's the one who would take all the suffering and shame and grief and pain, and he carries it away for us. He bore it all on his cross. All the tears of God's people that have been shed on this earth will be eternally forgotten ten seconds in heaven. <laughs> and I'm being generous with the time. What does the revelation tell us? He will wipe away all tears. They're gone. I don't know about you, I've shed a lot of tears in this world and probably will some more. And in, like that, he will wipe away all tears. All the grief will be turned into shouts of acclamation and joy when we see his face. Yes. Jeremiah not only described Rachel's weeping over death, but he also, in that passage I mentioned a while ago, invites her to wipe her tears comforting her with a new revelation of life in Jeremiah 31, 16. Thus says the Lord, Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. You see in there? Keep your eyes from tears. Just wipe your tears. There's this weeping that is here. There's this destruction. There's the sadness of Rachel's story. There's a sadness of Jeremiah's story. There's a sadness after Jesus is born. But listen, all that's going to culminate together that he is going to come to a place where he wipes all those tears away. We often sing here, the enemy thought he had me. <laughs> but Jesus said, you're mine. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I don't know what you're going through, but the enemy doesn't have you. That's right. You may think he has you, but Jesus says you're mine. Yeah. Wipe your tears away. And remember where your hope is at. Yeah. This new covenant would be bought by the only one who survived Herod's slaughter of the babies. Jesus would in all ways be acquainted with grief, and he would share in our suffering and he would die as one of us. But the psalmist tells us, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's a new morn come. Christ, who is our eternal Savior's day, has dawned. Isn't that good to know his day has dawned? So do we have a hope? Yeah, he's already come. He's already done the business. David's throne is prophetically, eternally filled. Of the increase of his government, speaking of Isaiah, his prophecy, the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. The sun of righteousness arises with healing in his wings. This is comfort for your every sorrow. He will wipe away all your tears. This is the grace for all of your sins. This is the good news of great joy, which for me, for all people, as we started the message, as we heard, Christ is born in Bethlehem, and this is the thrill of hope. This is the thrill of our hope. Are you as a person associated with grief and suffering if, you've ever, if you're ever to rejoice in this world, and I want to tell you, I've shed tears in this world, but I want to rejoice in this world as well. Yeah, amen. I want to gather children together and my family together and put hands on them and bless them, and I want to win people to Christ, and I want to share the gospel message. And listen, I don't want to wish my weeks of life away here, but I can't wait till Christmas Eve <laughs> when people who don't even like God come to church. 
and we can have an opportunity to share the gospel each one of these weeks leading up to that and I hope we pack the building and they sit around the sides of the, of the auditorium and other rooms and so forth. And so take your Christmas invite cards and go tell them about the thrill of hope you have in this world. Amen. And let's just see if we can get a whole double arm load of people into heaven in this little time season that we have left. Amen? Amen. And we'll experience the thrill of hope together. If you're ever to rejoice in this weary world, find the Christ born in Bethlehem and ask Him to be born in you. May we have our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. In the stillness of this moment, I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds. And you think about the things that you've heard this morning. I mentioned that it was this new covenant that would be bought by the only son who survived Herod's slaughter, Jesus. He had 33 years to fulfill all that God had planned for him. He was born in those swaddling clothes, a lamb that had come to die. And when it came time to die, his body was broken and his blood was shed. And when we take communion together, as we're about to just now, we remember that his body was broken and his blood was shed. And then his body was wrapped in death as it was in birth. And he was laid in a grave. And of course we know three days later, he stepped out alive. And by putting faith in that, as I hope I make clear in the scriptures, that's how one becomes born again. That's how you'll know that though they may put your body in a grave, you're going to heaven. And there will even be a resurrection of your body one day. The scriptures say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if I die before I get to my truck today, I know I'm in heaven. How do I know that? Because the Spirit of God in my spirit is crying, Abba, Father, even now. And I hope He's crying out for you. And I hope your heart is open to hear Him. How about you? If you were to die before you got home today, would heaven be your home? Do you know it? You can know it. The Scriptures tell us that we can know it. As the prophecy mentioned a moment ago, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you asked Him to be your Savior? If the Spirit is speaking to you and drawing you to Himself just now, and you would like to be saved, or you're living in doubt of that, or you're not certain, listen, you can be certain. These things are written, the Scriptures say that you know that you can be the sons and daughters of God. Begin to cry out to God out of your heart and ask Him to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sins. If you need help wording a prayer like that, let me offer this prayer to you. And you can pray it behind me. You don't have to pray it out loud, but out of your heart, pray a simple prayer like this. Dear God, I do believe that you love me and I confess that I'm a sinner. And I do believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross and that you died for me and for my sins. I'm asking you, Jesus, right now to be my Savior. I'm asking it by faith. I'm asking it in Jesus' name.